Hi, everybody, and welcome to Love Fraud Live. So, enough dating a senior sociopath, uh, someone who's over age 50 and has an exploitative personality disorder. Dating is bad. Being married to one is far worse. I'm Donna Anderson, author of lovefraud.com, and tonight I'll talk about senior sociopaths as husbands and wives. At the end of my presentation, I'll answer your questions. To join the chat or ask a question, please go ahead and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Okay, no one intentionally marries a sociopath. We marry someone who we believe is loving and caring and shares our interests and values. It's only later, sometimes many years later, that we realize the person we thought we married doesn't even exist. My new book, Senior Sociopaths, is based on a survey that I did with love fraud readers. I asked them to describe their experiences with people who were age 50 or older and who they believed were sociopaths. Of the 2,120 people who responded to the survey, 681 were married to the sociopaths. They were marriages from hell. Survey respondents described lies, manipulation, gaslighting, theft, adultery, violence, and abuse, although they didn't see these behaviors right away. Typically when they met, their future partners were charming, loving, sexy, and fun. 130 respondents met and married these partners while they were both in their teens or 20s. In these cases, hell lasted forever. 96% of the couples were together 20 years or more. In fact, when they completed the surveys, 72% of respondents were still married to the sociopaths, although it's more accurate to say that they were still trapped. One of the most fascinating findings of my research was how many s survey respondents saw their partners change at age 50. 375 survey respondents, including those who married while young, reported that they knew the individual both before and after age 50. The changes they saw were shocking, and it didn't seem to matter whether the marriages were long or short. Of those married five years or more, 82% reported that the individual changed at 50. Of those who were married only one to four years, 73% still saw a change at 50. So here are the top eight ways that the disordered partners changed. First, 24% said their spouses became meaner, more abusive, and cruel. In fact, many respondents noted that their partner seemed to enjoy causing them pain. One man said his wife was a nightmare of constant verbal, mental, emotional, and psychological abuse. And a woman said her husband's narcissistic behavior patterns intensified. He got much worse as she started emotionally disengaging. Second, 23% said their husband or wife changed into a different person. Survey respondents were shocked to realize that the person they thought they had married was gone, replaced by a total stranger. One woman said her husband was less able to fake empathy or sympathy. And a man wrote that his wife's true self came out around 50. He found out that she was having affairs throughout the entire marriage. He said that this woman was intermittently sober. And the older she got, the more money she spent on veneers, plastic surgery, shoes, purses, and clothes. Here's the third finding. 22% of survey respondents said their spouse became cold, distant, and withdrawn. They said that their spouses showed no love or empathy. 
They withdrew from the family and sometimes didn't come home. Several respondents described living separate lives, more like roommates than husband and wife. Fourth, 20% reported cheating, affairs, or a double life. Now, this figure, 20%, came in response to one particular question in which respondents could write whatever they wanted. However, cheating was far more rampant than this question indicated. A different multiple choice question asked about harm suffered in the relationship. One of the options was if the individual was your romantic partner, he or she cheated on you. 66% of survey respondents said yes, he or she was a cheater. So there was a lot of cheating going on. Okay, here's the fifth finding. 18% of survey respondents saw more devious lying, manipulation, and gaslighting. One man wrote that his wife became more manipulative and kept him from his children and hid her financial manipulation. A woman who was married to her disordered husband for more than 20 years wrote that he got better at lying, more manipulative, more punishing, more devious, and more spiteful. And he did all this while smiling and acting nice and helpful. Here's the sixth finding. 15% of survey respondents experienced increased anger, aggression, rage, threats, and violence. One woman said her husband was less controlling of his mood swings. He was angrier and had a shorter fuse. Another woman wrote that at first her husband was a complete gentleman. He was interested, engaged, and love-bombed her. After 50, this man was always angry. He wanted abusive sex and total control. Seventh, another 15% of survey respondents experienced more blaming, criticism, and put-downs. Now, blaming isn't listed as a defining trait of exploitative personality disorders, but it should be. Just about all sociopaths are prolific blamers. One woman said she went from being on a pedestal to a person who couldn't do anything right. Her husband kept moving the goalposts. He blamed her for everything wrong in the relationship, and he created near constant drama and chaos. And here's the last of the findings. 13% experienced more control, isolation, stalking, and the silent treatment. What sociopaths want from all their relationships, including marriage, is power and control. Even after divorce, they still want to maintain power and control over their exes. So, why is this information important for you? Because you need to know that marriage to a sociopath never gets any better and almost always gets worse. So if you come to the conclusion that your husband or wife is a sociopath and they have a personality disorder, the sooner you get out, the better. Don't keep enduring the lies, cheating, and abuse, hoping and praying that your partner will eventually calm down. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen. Okay, so let's see if we have some questions. We certainly have comments. So AM says, sadly, I was strongly pushed into marriage and when very sick and losing my career. Now the truth has come out about the corruption of the courts and how they sell children to the wealthiest relatives. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, that's another nightmare. In fact, um, in a couple weeks, I'll be talking about sociopaths as senior sociopaths as parents. And it's not good. Um, these, the information that I'll present is particularly from the children who grew up with disordered parents. 
Uh, there's still there are also some comments from observers um, who who observe the parenting, but the information from the children themselves is um, it's worse than we think. So uh, that's that's really kind of dismal. And my big goal with love fraud is to warn people about the sociopaths among us so that hopefully you can spot them before you get into these situations. But since there's so many of them, <laughs> many of us have already been caught. Okay. So sociopath survivor says, I've always been curious about how Sam Vaknin's marriage to his wife works. And she's put works in quotation marks. Um, I don't know his, what his relationship is all about. Um, although <laughs> I, I can't imagine that it's good. You know, a lot of people, I mean, even people in the survey is like I mentioned, there were many who, well, I guess about a hundred who were, you know, got married young and then were still involved with this person. You know, they, they, they were still married and, you know, 20, 30, 40 years have gone by. And in some cases, the lives are just so intertwined that it's, well, put it this way. Some folks make the decision that staying is the less bad thing to do. Um, because it would be even worse to leave, which sometimes is the case. Um, but it, it, it will continue to get worse and worse. So what happens in his marriage? I have, I don't know, but a lot of people just find a way to endure. Um, but this is, this is a pretty scary thing because I also have stories of people you know, I mean, once you really become old and need assistance and need help, you know, it's your spouse who has usually has like medical power of attorney and is responsible for helping you out if you're old and in a wheelchair and need surgery or anything like that. And sociopaths don't care. You know, they're, they're, they're not going to go out of their way to take care of a disabled partner or someone who, who needs care. I mean, they don't do it when they're young. I've, I've heard stories of sociopaths who refuse to take their wives to the hospital when they're about to deliver a baby. What are they going to do when, when these people are old? So it's Probably in all cases, the best idea is to get out of this situation, out of the marriage, as soon it, as it's possible to do it. Okay, so we have some questions. Okay, so J. Susie asks, have neuroscientists looked into the brains of sociopaths under imaging tests and found anything? Um, the answer is yes. Um, now, typically this work is done with those who would be diagnosed as psychopaths, which is a little bit different from those with antisocial personality disorder. It's a more narrow definition, but absolutely yes. In fact, there's a, a, a professor by the name of Kent Keel who, that's what he does. He does brain images of psychopaths. He, he's got his is it this big trailer set up in at the University of New Mexico where he's um, running scans on people's brains. They do fMRI, which is functional magnetic resonance in imaging. And yeah, there, there are things that are different. Uh, a couple of the differences are there's um, a, a structure in the brain called the amygdala, which is kind of looks like a, an almond and it's kind of at the base of your skull. And they found significant differences in the amygdalas of psychopaths as opposed to um, people who are not disordered. 
there's also a difference in the amount of uh, gray matter. There's a certain part of the brain, um, and psychopaths just have less of it than other people do. Um, there, there are definitely physiological differences um, in people who are psychopaths. However, it hasn't gotten to the point where um, they can like do a brain scan on somebody and determine whether or not the person is disordered. Uh, you know, because there's there's a lot that goes into it. Um, there is an interaction between nature, meaning what you're born with, and nurture, which is what how you grow up and what type of parenting you get. So it's, it's not at the point where, you know, you can give someone a brain scan to diagnose whether or not they're a psychopath. Um, maybe it'll happen, but it's, it's not there yet. Okay. So Jay Sweezy also asks, is there a higher rate of dementia with sociopath-like brains in seniors, or are there no statistics about this yet? Um, you know, my book is actually groundbreaking when it comes to senior sociopaths because there is, there's no data. I mean, there literally is no data beyond what I have in my book related to senior sociopaths. In fact, you know, one of the main purposes of my book was to dispel the notion that is prevalent in the psychology field that sociopaths burn out. I mean, th this is actually stated in several psychology textbooks that uh, in their 40s, sociopaths burn out. Um, this made no sense to me because when I met my ex-husband, he was, he was older than that. Um, of course, he lied about his age. You know, first he told me that he was 49 and then he, he couldn't bear to lie to me. So he claimed that he was 51. In reality, he was 55. But the point is that the entire time I knew him, he was over the age of 50 and he took a million dollars from me and, and four other women. Um, so, I mean, he was, he was doing all this behavior, certainly well beyond the age of 40. So the fact of the matter is that most of the research that's been done in this age group over 40, over 50, even over 60, is done with prisoners. Be and, and that's all. And, and so, you know, the researchers do not have a data set of people who aren't in prison. And this is exactly what I'm presenting in this book. So it, it's really groundbreaking. So as far as the dementia is concerned, um, I haven't seen anything about whether or not, whether or not um, people with psychopathy and, and how that affects dementia, but one thing that has been identified is that sometimes when people get dementia, they engage in antisocial behavior. I mean, some actually, you know, become violent and aggressive. Um, and, and it's a factor, it's a, a reason, it's the dementia as opposed to antisocial behavior. So the key difference is whether or not the person engaged in antisocial behavior all their lives, or if it starts when they're 70 or 80 years old. And if that's the case, that it started when they're 70 or 80 years old, the person probably has some form of dementia and not likely antisocial behavior. Okay. Okay, so Callboy is asking about fatal attraction. Uh, in all honesty, I haven't seen that movie in so long. Um, it might be interesting to look at it now because when I saw it, it was long before my experience with a, a psychopath, a sociopath. So um, maybe one of these days I'll take a look and, and see how it is because it, I, I don't remember. Um, but that woman certainly was into trying to maintain that relationship. So we'd have to take a look. Okay. 
Oh, here you go. My ex refused to take me to the hospital when in labor with my first child and during a huge snow snowstorm, during which they closed IBM and the roads at 4 p.m. for the first time. Right. So if your ex wouldn't take you to the hospital then, what would happen when you're old and in a wheelchair and, and you need someone to take care of you and, and, you know, do all those basic things and feed you and bathe you and, and everything else. Is that going to happen? No, it's not going to happen. So that's a reason why it could be very important to leave a sociopath while you still have the ability to do it. Okay, Celeste says, my mom was a psychopath. I wonder if I will ever heal enough. You can. Um, it does require a lot of effort. It requires um, commitment to yourself that you want to heal. Um, and the way you do it, which is the way we always heal from the betrayal of these relationships, whether it's your parents, whether it's a love interest, whether it's your boss, you need to allow yourself to feel the pain. And I've said this in a bunch of videos. So if you've watched a bunch of videos, you, you may um, hear me repeating myself, but this is what we do. I mean, you, you have to, you have to get it out of your system. And when it's your parents who've been disordered, that pain can go really, really deep and it, it can be kind of hard to access it, but it is possible. Um, you could work with a therapist and which could be helpful, but actually all the work, all the real work only you can do because you're the only one who could feel your emotions. I mean, no one can feel your emotions for you. So, um, at least knowing on an intellectual level that many of the feelings and also the experiences are a result of the fact that your mother was a psychopath, um, that can help on an intellectual level to understand what happened, but the real healing is emotional and the way you do it is to is to go deep and, and find those wounds and find the pain and let yourself cry or express your anger appropriately. What, I mean, whatever, I mean, not towards your mother, that's useless, but banging pillows is what I did. Um, but yeah, it can be done. It absolutely can be done. <clears throat> Okay, so Michelle says, since going through the court process with my ex and his domestic violence history, I now realize how completely oblivious our so-called justice system is to these disordered people. How can we push education? Um, one thing to keep in mind is that judges, lawyers, court personnel, at one point, was just as clueless about sociopaths as we all are. And they may still be just as clueless about sociopaths. Um, so there, there are people who are working on some efforts to try and get more information into the family courts because you know, the courts are often a nightmare. Um, one of the problems is that a lot of judges and court personnel simply want everybody, they, they want all their cases to be the same. They, they want their cases, they want cookie cutter cases, you know, where you do this, 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 and this. And they want parents to play nice. And you can't, you know, if you're dealing with a sociopath. I mean, there are some enlightened judges um, who get it, but sociopaths are so evil and they also tend to find sociopathic attorneys who are just willing to pull out all the stops, you know, going after you. So it's, it's a very difficult situation. But 
um, if we keep educating, you know, keep keep getting the word out, you know, maybe people are reading the books or, or watching the show or whatever, um, it will help. I mean, my main objective with Love Fraud is to let people know that sociopaths exist. I mean, that's, that's the main objective. And because most people don't know. And I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, I never knew people like this existed. Well, they do. And so and I hope, you know, that all of you who are watching understand that now, that yes, they're out there and we need to protect ourselves from them. Oops. So Celeste says, I see psychopathic behavior everywhere. Does everyone feel that way once they have gotten free of it? It's more once you've been educated um, because, yeah, there's lots of it. I talk about how many sociopaths we live among. And of course, you know, by sociopaths, I mean people who could be diagnosed with a cluster B personality disorder, which is antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, or histrionic personality disorders, or psychopathy. Now, if you look at the research, uh, depending on what study you look at, you know, it's from 5.5% to 17.5% of the population, according to these experts, um, could have one of these cluster B personality disorders. So if we take a midpoint, which is 12%, if we estimate that 12% of the population are sociopaths, that means it's 31 million people in the United States, 31 million adults in the United States could have one of these personality disorders. That's a lot of people. So yeah, they're everywhere. And it's, I think it's more that now that your eyes are opened and you know what this behavior looks, looks like, now you can recognize it. It's always been there, but now you can see it. Okay, so Michelle says he did get prison time, but how they interacted with me. Thank God I am educated now, because if not, I would hate to think about where I'd be. Well, Michelle, that's really great that um, he got prison time. I mean, that's, that's fabulous. Okay, so Maritza says, I wish I knew this information before I got involved. Thank you for writing the book and bringing awareness. Well, that's, that's the objective. That's what I'm trying to do. And we can all spread the word. I mean, now that we know what they are and we educate ourselves, then, you know, we have opportunities. We, we tell our kids, we, we tell our family members, you know, and, and it's, it's better to do that once you start to be recovered, you know, because you need to be able to talk about this calmly. You know, if, if you're still in a state of upset over your experience, which is totally understandable and it, and it takes time to get over that, but people can't hear the information. They can only hear the upset. So later on, you know, when you're, when you're feeling better, when you've started to recover, that's when it's a good time to talk to people. Although sometimes you have to, depending on who they are, you may need to explain your situation, um, but it's always best to try and do it as calmly as possible so that the listener can actually hear your information rather than reacting to the, the pain of it all. Um, but working together, we can absolutely get the word out about all these disordered people living among us. Okay, well, that looks like the end of the questions that we have for today. So thank you everybody for joining us and um, we'll be here next week to talk about sociopaths again in the next episode of Love Fraud Live. Thank you, good night. <laughs>